Ever notice those characters in video games who seem to just exist? The shopkeeper who says the same line every time you visit, the villager who walks in circles, the guard who won't let you pass because you don't have the right item. These are non-player characters or NPCs. Hey, um, are you a real person or an NPC? I don't have time for your nonsense. Move along. They are the digital extras that populate our virtual worlds. But they're more than just window dressing. They're the backbone of every game universe. Some give you quests, others provide crucial information. Some just add life to the world by gossiping about local events or complaining about the weather. They have daily routines, remember your actions, and sometimes even make complex decisions. Tomorrow, the air quality is going to be terrible, they said. I hate my life. My man was staring at this blonde, so I dyed my hair blonde. Who cares? In recent years, people have started using NPC as a way to describe real-world behavior that seems programmed. You know the type. People who seem to repeat the same phrases, follow the same routines, never questioning, never deviating, always following the crowd. This isn't actually a new idea. Ancient Gnostic philosophers had a similar concept. They divided humanity into three categories. And they were divided by their spiritual ability. The first are called pneumatics, from the word pneuma, meaning spirit. And they are spiritually awake, or at least in the process of awakening. The second category of people are the psychics, from psyche, which can mean soul. And these are basically non-player characters who have the ability to become awake. And the last group are called Hylix from highly meaning matter. The Hylix are understood to basically be materialist. Their only concern is for food, sex and material pleasures. They have no interest in anything beyond that. Clearly this idea is not new, it goes back thousands of years. But even before the Gnostics, similar ideas appeared in religious texts. Take Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares, for example, which is a story about a farmer who sowed good seeds in his field, only to find that during the night an enemy had planted weeds among them. Another parable he pointed out to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man sowing good seed in his field. And during the sleeping of the men, his enemy came and sowed weeds in the midst of the grain and went forth. And when the blade burst forth and fruit was produced, then appeared also the weeds. And coming forward, the bondmen of the master of the house said to him, O oh master, was it not good seed you sowed in your field? From where then have the weeds come? And he said to them, An enemy, a man did this. And the bondman said to him, Did you want us to go forth and gather them? And he said, No, lest gathering the weeds you should root out together with them the grain. Allow them both to grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the harvesters, Gather together first the weeds and tie them into a bundle and burn them. But the grain you gather together onto my storehouse. And then fast forward to 1334, the disciples actually asked Jesus, what did he mean by the parable of the wheat and the tares? And he says, And that's what the good seed is, the son of man. And the field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, and the weeds are the sons of the wicked one. And the enemy sowing them is the devil. And the harvest is the completion of the age. And the harvesters are the angels. As then, the weeds are collected together and incinerated in the fire. So it will be in the completion of this aeon. The son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather together from out of his kingdom all the ones causing offense 
and the ones committing lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the just ones will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Those who have the ears to hear, let them hear. The parable of the wheat and his hairs is telling us that there are two vastly different types of people here. And that one is a progeny, offspring, descendant, literally, of the Father, the Most High Father, not the God of this world. And then the tares are children of the devil, children that the devil has sown, his seed, his sperma. In the parable, he says that they look so much like the wheat, the children of God. The children of the devil are identical visually to children of God. So what I'm going to postulate is that the people that Jesus Christ calls the tares are also what we would refer to today as organic portals or NPCs, um, basically warm bodies that are operating on the hive mind that have no critical thought faculty. Just as NPCs in games can look like player characters but lack true agency, the parable suggests that some people might appear identical to others on the surface, yet fundamentally differ in their inner nature. Uh, but Miles, th there's no emotion. None. Just the pretense of it. The words, gesture, the tone of voice, everything else is the same, but not the feeling. Dolores Cannon, who was an author and hypnotherapist, referred to NPCs as backdrop people. Uh, but I think we are, we're going to go into the backdrop people. This came up in my last book. I put it into convoluted four. I could go into a lot more strange concepts and they may come up with the questioning. But in convoluted four, I've got this concept of the backdrop people. Everybody keeps wanting more information about it. And all I had was what I wrote about. Well, now I'm getting more information because it's coming through more and more people. It's like when the concept is ready, then we get more and more information keeps coming in. They know when I'm ready and I'm supposed to present it to the world. Okay. Well, the idea, nothing is real anyway. Everything is energy. Everything is illusion. This building where you're sitting right now did not even exist until you collectively chose to come here tonight or today. Wrap your head around that. <laughs> it's like a Stephen King movie they had one time where nothing existed before they got there. That's right. I mean, what you're doing is you're creating your own realities, and now you've created a huge group reality. And without the huge group reality, this wouldn't exist. But this shows you, too, how powerful your mind is. Because everything you see, everything that's around you, everything in your life, you are creating and putting there. To fill up your, your world. So that means you can create anything. Nothing is impossible. You can change your life. You can have anything in your life at all. They told me one of the biggest lessons you come to Earth to learn is how to manipulate energy. You can't get out of the Earth school and graduate till you learn how to manipulate energy. What does that mean? Create. You have to learn to create. Because this is how powerful your mind is. You can create anything. So that means every time you go anywhere, even go back to your house, it is recreated every time you go into it. I always wonder, where does it go in the meantime? <laughs> it's just space. <laughs> back into whatever. But when these concepts began coming up, you know, this is it's a little unnerving. 
But the backdrop people was really uh, scrambled my brain. And everywhere I go now, they'll say, tell us more about the backdrop people. Okay, you're creating, this is your movie, this is your play. You are, are the, it's all that life is anyway, it's just a game, it's just a play, it's just an illusion. You're going to leave here with your brains really spinning, <laughs> okay. But I've had people say that when they go through the death experience in the past life, they look back and they'll say, it's just a play. I see all the actors on stage getting ready to play their parts. I see the actors in the wings getting ready to come on stage and play their parts. It's just a play. But when I was there, I took it so seriously, but now it's like a blink of an eye. So you are the producer, director, and actor in your own play. You're also the script writer, but the script isn't written. It's written as you go along. Do you see you can change it any time you want? We get so trapped into thinking there's no way out. Not, you know, that this is all there is. When you realize how powerful your mind is, you can create anything you want. This is the goal, the main thing of being alive is knowing, learning how to create. And now when the bale is thinning, we're moving into this new earth, we're into the shifting, we're bringing all these abilities back. This is what you're supposed to learn how to do. Okay, but this is your movie. Now they said, it, it wouldn't be a very good movie, would it, if you were the only person in the movie? Isn't that true? They said people like people around them. So what they would we do, we don't know this, none of this is done consciously. You have the backdrop people. When you cast a movie, what do you do? You cast all these extras, don't you? To fill in the background, the backdrop. He calls them the backfill. You cast all the extras to play all the parts of all the people. Those are the backdrop people. And when I go into a crowded airport now, I was thinking, oh boy, look at all the backdrop people I've just created. <laughs> I shouldn't have put so many into this. <laughs> but this is what makes it even stranger. The backdrop people are not real. They're not real people. They're not anything. They are energy. And I said, uh, do they have souls? They said, no, they're just energy. They said it's holographic. A great example of backdrop people slash spiritless humans are psychopaths. But from my research, it appears that psychopaths are failed organic portals slash spiritless humans. The vast majority of organic portals don't break any laws or stand out in any way, but they have no real center. They have no self-awareness. They are basically empty inside and can be used by the matrix as agents to keep beings who have spirit from becoming awake because they are basically an expression of the matrix. They are in the world and they are off the world. It appears that there are two types of NPCs. The first type has the ability to become conscious, the type that Gnostics called psychics. But it's just that they're essentially under hypnosis and therefore they are asleep. And the second type has no ability to wake up in this lifetime, no matter how hard you try to wake them up. And this second type are what are called organic portals. And Gnostics called them hylix, as I've already mentioned. But in terms of behavior, and the level of consciousness, there is no difference between NPCs and organic portals. The main difference is the potential to become awake. And as long as we're all spiritually unconscious, we are all basically organic portals. For years and years and years, I used to tell people, 
You know, it really strikes me strange that there are so many people that seem to me that they're like cardboard cutouts. And I, what I mean is like you, you meet people who you get to know them a little, you have conversations with them, you interact with them, and you discover that, you know, they're not just surface. That's all they are. You think, well, if I get to know this person better, they'll, they'll talk to me about a deep subject. They'll exchange with me a, a deep conversation. They will tell me how they really feel. They'll tell me about their hopes. But then you get to know them better and better, and you find out that the only thing they are, the only thing there is somebody who talks about football, soap operas, um, you know, the what they shopped for, uh, where they went for their vacation, the their new car, uh, the new drapes in their house, and that, and then they just go around that circle again, and around that circle again, and around that circle again. Their entire lives, there is there is no depth to them. There is nobody inside. They are like they are like simulacra of human beings. So I had noticed this for years. I mean, this was back when my when my children were little. Because I had, as I said, I worked for uh, for the state welfare office, and I interacted with a lot of people, and I had to interact with a lot of people. And of course, I'd been a couple of years in university, and like everybody else, you know, had met and interacted with at various levels, thousands and thousands of people. And there were these people who stood out as being like cardboard. You go into a store and you see, a, you know, a cutout of somebody trying to sell you something and it's got a stick on the back of it that props it up and it looks like it's life-size and it's like a life-size man or woman and then you look around behind it there's a stick holding it up there are human beings like that I don't know what made me the way I am but whatever it was left a hollow place inside people fake a lot of human interactions but I feel like I fake them all and I fake them very well Ahoy there, Captain! Any big marlin out there today? And that's my burden, I guess. But until the Cassiopeians started talking to me about organic portals, I had no theory to understand that. Even Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff said you can walk down the street. If you walk down the street and you understood how many people you pass are dead, and he meant, you know, uh, their essence, their their inner being, there was no inner being to them. He said, you would go mad with terror if you understood how many there are. Just like me, empty inside. Well, he didn't understand it in the terms of organic portals. So along come the Cassiopeians and they give a name and a description of a type of being that I had noticed for all my life and Gurdjieff noticed and wrote about, and other people, Castaneda even talked about, he said there are people who have uh, uh, only three uh, or only two lights in their makeup. He was talking about seeing them uh, paranormally. But then there are others who have more. They have three. And those are the people who have soul potential, so to speak. Those weren't the exact words he used, but that's what he meant. The, The topic of organic portals has received a great deal of support from esoteric literature and even from scientific research. Uh, Some of the research that um, has come out recently is the fact that everybody on the planet has some Neanderthal genes, except for all the people in Africa. You know, there has long been this contention between uh, the different views, the out of Africa or the out of Asia model. Well, you know, maybe it's neither, maybe it's both, but there is some evidence that there are significantly different types of human beings on the planet, genetically speaking. Uh, which is which, you know, I wouldn't venture to say at this point. Uh, But there is also the material from Moraviev, and then there is also uh, a fairly plain statement in the New Testament by Jesus, you know, that indicates that there are people who are children of another God, so to say. Um, So, you know, for the Cassiopeians to, to give it a precise definition that meshes more or less with the work of Moraviev, uh, as well as the work of Castaneda, is quite interesting. Uh, so I would say that there is a considerable lateral and vertical support for that idea, 
And also the research into psychopathy and personality disorders gives us a little bit more of a scientific basis to look at it. So, you know, it's something that should be being worked on by real scientists, you know, not just, you know, speculated on by, you know, by, by just me or uh, groups of people who want to play spot the OP. I mean, that's not the objective. You know, let's, let's do some research. Let's find out what's going on on our planet. We, we, you know, time's running out. Here you go. Thank you. Buddy, what would you do if you found out that you weren't real? What are you? Are you a person or a machine? I'm a lady! A real lady? Every inch! Wait, wait, a real, real lady? Are you a human being? Yes, and I may very well be the only decent human being left. In Stepford? In the world! I think the world is...